we're going to begin on page 13 with a translation. Obviously, you all know that Isaiah was not written in English. It's in the Hebrew Bible, so Isaiah was written in Hebrew. And uh, this is a Christian translation that I actually took right off of a missionary website. Uh, as you probably can appreciate, there are dozens of Christian translations of the Hebrew Scriptures, and uh, that's part of the difficulty of translating any text from Hebrew into English. There are actually even many Jewish translations of Isaiah into English. So the question of translation is one that we're not going to get too focused on today. Uh, it's very easy to actually spend several hours trying to dissect the syntax and translation of any sentence. It could be an extremely complicated matter. Uh, when translation is an issue, however, when translation is an issue, I will bring it to your attention. But generally, we're not going to get hung up with the nitty-gritty of different translated versions. Uh, let's just together read this passage from Isaiah. You'll notice that it doesn't really begin with chapter 53. This actually is a poem. It's a poem about the servant of the Lord, the servant of God, and there are actually four such poems in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has four, they're called servant songs. Four sir, songs or poems about the servant of the Lord. This is the fourth one. And it begins not with chapter 53, verse 1. It begins with chapter 52, verse 13. Now you could ask yourself, isn't that a sort of strange place to break the chapters? Wouldn't it make more sense to start chapter 53 three verses earlier? So I can tell you that, uh, don't speak to any Jews about this, these chapter breaks and divisions were put into the Bible by Christian monks in the Middle Ages, and uh, there is something handy about it, because if you go to the original text of Isaiah, there weren't any chapter breaks at all. And you'd have one very long text. And in order to make it easier to navigate through this book, the Christians who broke it into chapters and verses for us made it easier for the whole world on some level. But again, it made it difficult because there is a message that's communicated on the way the chapters were broken up. And we will not go into today what might have motivated the monks to break the chapters the way they did. But I'm just pointing out that it's not a natural break. That the song begins toward the end of chapter 52. So again, we're going to read this Christian translation. And uh, we'll discuss it for about the next hour and a half. Okay. Behold, my servant will prosper he will be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For that which they had not been told, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, 
Yet he opened not his mouth, like a sh lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He will see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Christian missionaries normally will try to either read this to a Jewish person or have the Jewish person read this passage and then ask the question, who does it sound like? Who does this sound like? I have a book by a missionary named Barry Rubin, a book called You Bring the Bagels, I'll Bring the Gospel. And Barry Rubin says in this book that when he was shown this passage as a young man, he was immediately convinced that it was speaking about Jesus and he accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. Question that we should think about is, how did he know this was speaking about Jesus. You know, there are, if you go on the internet, you'll find many, many internet websites where people think that they've seen the face of Jesus either in a piece of pizza or in an oil stain or in the clouds. A few years ago, a piece of pizza sold for $14,000 on eBay because it had the face of Jesus apparently in it. The question is very obvious, what does Jesus look like? Does anyone know what he really looked like? And how do you know that's his face in that piece of pizza? But it's clear that someone like Barry Rubin and others who immediately assume it's speaking about Jesus come to the text with some impressions already in their mind about who Jesus may have been. There are many similar optical illusions where they will have you stare, for example, at an image. And if you stare at an image for enough time and then avert your gaze to a, a blank wall, you'll see an after effect of that image on the wall. So Jewish people that grow up in Christian cultures that are familiar with the Christian narrative and are, are familiar with the claims of Christianity might very well jump to that conclusion that so many people like Barry Rubin have jumped to and assume, wow, this sounds like Jesus. And What's important to understand is that our very understanding of who Jesus was is only found in the Christian scriptures. And it's very possible that those very Christian scriptures were written in order to create the impression that Jesus fulfilled messianic prophecy. And there are times in the Gospels where it becomes embarrassingly evident. For example, there is a story where Jesus rides into Jerusalem during the Passion Week. And in the Gospel of Mark, he mounts a donkey, he gets on a donkey, and he rides into Jerusalem. But in the Gospel of Matthew, he gets two donkeys, and he awkwardly puts a blanket over two donkeys and somehow manages to ride into Jerusalem on the back of two donkeys at once. It's a very awkward way of riding. It's hard to imagine why anyone on the planet would saddle two animals at the same time and ride like that. Until we understand what might have led Matthew to do this in his recreation of the story. Matthew was basing himself upon a famous passage in the Jewish Bible from the prophet Zechariah. And Zechariah, in describing the Messiah riding on the back of a donkey, Zechariah uses a very, very popular and common poetic uh, convention in the Hebrew Bible, which is to say the same thing in two ways. 
So Zechariah speaks about this donkey and uses two expressions to describe the donkey in the same way when the Bible describes, for example, Re Rebecca, Rivka, I think, it says she was a virgin, she knew no man. Well, that's exactly what a virgin is. And yet the Bible will say the same thing in two ways for emphasis sometimes. So Zechariah was describing this Messiah coming into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, but Matthew misunderstood the sense, the meaning of the Hebrew. Matthew, for some reason, didn't realize it was a parallel structure where the same thing was said in two ways. So Matthew wrote the story the way he understood Zechariah, that Jesus did this awkward thing of riding on two animals. Whereas Mark, who didn't misunderstand the Hebrew, has Jesus riding on the back of one animal. The point here is that it's quite possible that when the Gospel writers give their, their picture of Jesus and his life, you may not be necessarily reading about Jesus. You may be reading what certain people want us to know about Jesus because it was constructed in a way where they feel their picture fulfills what the Old Testament expected of the Messiah. That's just a caveat and maybe a little bit of a warning. Now what we're going to do is to discuss how we as Jews might think through, analyze the Christian claim that's being made for this passage. If you turn to page 14, we'll begin by understanding that many Jewish people have been very intimidated by this passage. Many Jewish people, when they're shown this passage by Christian missionaries, get very excited and say, I don't want to see anything from your Christian New Testament. There are many Jews that assume this passage sounds so much like Jesus, it must be from the New Testament. And the missionary smiles and says, no, I'm sorry, this is from your Jewish Bible. Isaiah is one of your guys. Isaiah is a Jewish prophet. And Jewish people have been either intimidated by this passage or confused by it. So our job today is going to try to be to understand it. And the first session we're going to be doing now will be basically a critical analysis of the Christian claims. And when we come back to the third session, we'll try to approach the passage from a Jewish perspective. We begin with a passage from the book of Proverbs where King Solomon says, the first to state his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him. Very often, and I, I enjoy sometimes watching these courtroom TV shows where you see an actual trial recreated, and sometimes when you hear the case, for example, made against someone, the case that's trying to show, for example, someone is guilty of a crime, you listen to the the case of the prosecution, you say, wow, this person is cooked. They really sound guilty. How are they ever going to get out of this? And then the defense attorney is able to very skillfully basically refute everything that the prosecution has said. But sometimes when you hear a case that's made, it can sound convincing. It can sound convincing. So Solomon is telling us here that sometimes when someone asserts their position, you can be taken in by it. But you should realize there's always a counter point of view. There's another perspective, and that's what we have to examine. You know, they tell a story, I may not, I'm, I'm not sure it's actually necessarily historically 100% true, but it's a famous story told about the Gaon of Vilna, that a missionary once came to him and said, you know, Rabbi, I'm going to prove to you Christianity from your very own Jewish Bible. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prove Christianity from the very first word in the Jewish Bible. And he opens up the beginning of the Jewish Bible, the book of Bereshit in the beginning. He says to the rabbi, look, rabbi, the first word in the Bible, Bereshit, the first three letters are Bez, Resh, Aleph. It stands for Ben, Ruach, Av, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. There you have it, rabbi, the Trinity, right in your Bible. The rabbi, without blinking, says, you know, you didn't look at the last three letters of the same word. The word ends with shin yud tuf. It stands for Torah yeshu sheker, that the teachings of Jesus and Christianity is falsehood. So, again, when someone states their case, it could sound like, wow, there's something here, but you have to realize there's always more to the story. Uh, Alan, who do you see on the board here? 
You see Marilyn Monroe, amazing. So this is a very famous optical illusion. When you look at this picture from far away, it does look like Marilyn Monroe. You have it in your sheets in front of you. It should be a little bit closer up. Who do you see in your sheets? It's Albert Einstein. Boy, those are two very different looking people. Marilyn Monroe or Albert Einstein, you decide. But it's a question of perspective and distance. You know, if you go to a museum and you watch, you look at a, uh, a display, for example, of oil paintings, what's amazing is through the illusion of distance, an oil painting, which is basically smears of oil on a canvas, can look very, very lifelike. You can look at a seascape, for example, from across the room, and it looks so real that you can see to yourself, you know, if I touch it, I'm sure my hand's going to get soaking wet. That's how real it looks. But if you walk up close to the seascape, you'll see the cracks, the imperfections, basically splotches of oil. So there are times when you look at something from far away, it could look like Marilyn Monroe. You get closer up, you realize you're looking at something quite different. And that's going to be the job for us today. That maybe superficially, or for people that, let's say, are living very far away from the Bible and don't know the Bible well, they could make Christological associations with this chapter in Isaiah. But I think as you get closer to the Bible and see it really from a close distance, from a, a close up distance, you'll see very quickly that this illusion disappears. I want to say from the outset, this is a very critical thing to state, that missionaries have set a very high bar for themselves. Because the missionary contention is that they can prove, that's a very strong word, their contention is that this passage in Isaiah proves that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Now I want you never to forget that claim because that's going to be our sort of marking point for today's class. I don't know if I can prove my interpretation of Isaiah today. It may take more than just an hour and a half. But the point of today is not necessarily to prove that we may have the ultimate true understanding of this passage. Our goal today is simply to answer the question, do the missionaries have proof for what they're claiming? Can they prove what they're claiming? And we'll see today that it's not difficult to evaluate that claim. Before we get started, I want to just point out two red herrings. Red herring number one is a very important one, but it's sometimes easy to miss. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah about three years before he was crucified. And not only did he claim to be the Messiah, he insisted that Jewish people accept him. As a matter of fact, he did something that was very unusual for Jewish leaders. He wouldn't allow any questioning. He wouldn't tolerate people that wanted to understand what his claims were. He simply insisted that people accept his claims for being the Messiah, and he would curse out. He would curse out those who wouldn't accept him. Now, Christians today say, but you have to believe in Jesus. He fulfilled Isaiah 53. They hold Isaiah 53 up. This is their, their, their most powerful piece of the evidence. But the red herring here is that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah way before Isaiah 53 was relevant. He wasn't saying that one day I'm going to be killed and crucified and then you should believe in me. He was claiming to be the Messiah while he was living. Isaiah 53 had not yet been fulfilled. As a matter of fact, most of the most powerful and popular proof texts that are used by Christian missionaries, Psalm 22 that we saw before, they pierced my hands and feet, that we saw was even based upon a mistranslation. It's based upon circular reasoning. But it's also irrelevant when Jesus was alive. Daniel chapter 9, a huge part of the missionary arsenal that speaks about the cutting off of the Messiah. Again, irrelevant while Jesus was alive. Missionaries are not saying that Jesus wasn't really the Messiah when he was alive and only became the Messiah afterwards. Jesus insisted he was the Messiah while he was living, and Christians insisted that we believe the same thing. And so Isaiah 53, at the end of the day, is really quite irrelevant to the claims of Jesus.
Red herring number two is that Christians would have us believe that this passage is the critical issue that separates Judaism from Christianity. Christians are very invested in all of us believing that somehow it's only the interpretation of this passage that separates Jews from Christians. And the reason this is a red herring is because it's totally off the mark. The truth is that there are many, many, many other places in the Bible where the differences between Christianity and Judaism are much more in greater relief. For example, the real divide between Judaism and Christianity is not simply on the question of whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. There are sometimes bigger questions. For example, was Jesus God as Christians claim he is? That's a much bigger issue because in the Torah, the most serious mistake that a Jew can make is the mistake of idolatry, the mistake of worshiping someone as God who is not God. And so that's a much more serious question, the question of what is idolatry? We saw before a much more serious question is what is man? Can human beings be good? Can we obey the Torah? How do you atone for your sins? These are all very serious questions. Another question, what about the Torah itself? Whether or not someone believes that Jesus is the Messiah is small potatoes compared to are they observing the Sabbath? Are they keeping kosher? These are commandments that God gave us that God says we have to follow forever. And so if someone believes in a false Messiah, let's say they don't believe Jesus is God, they simply believe Jesus was the Messiah, so they're, they're just strange. They have a strange idea. It's a sad idea. But if that idea influences them to stop observing the Torah, that's more serious business. So the main divide between Christianity and Judaism is not simply over the interpretation of this passage in Isaiah. Now, this program that we're going to do today, this second session, has three components. We're going to go through three basic critiques of the Christian approach to this passage. The first one is to ask the question, is this passage in Isaiah clearly a passage about the Messiah? Is it clear that Isaiah is speaking about the Messiah? Right? When you read that passage back on page 13, that's a very important question. The Christians insist that it's a messianic prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. I'm asking, is it really 100% clear that Isaiah is speaking about the person of the Messiah? Let's try to answer this question. Number one, and you'll see the handouts that I've given you are not just a source material, it's an outline. It actually takes you through the entire presentation. So problem number one, it's very clear when you study the Christian Bible that the followers of Jesus, his own students, did not understand Isaiah 53 to be a prophecy about the Messiah. Now this is very important. Let me share with you uh, a passage from the book of Matthew, which is interesting because prior to the passage that you have in front of you, which is chapter 16, verse 21, prior to this, it's not on your sheets, Jesus asks his students for the first time, it's very interesting, the topic had not come up. The topic had not come up prior to chapter 16 in Matthew. Jesus finally says to his students, who do you think I am? We've been traveling together for 16 chapters. Who do you think I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. Peter at this point says for the first time in the Christian Bible, Jesus, we believe that you're the Messiah. Now let me ask you a question. When Peter used that word, what did he know about the Messiah? Where would Peter have gotten his information from the Messiah from? Where would Peter have learned it from? Peter didn't have a New Testament. Peter was a Jew. And the only information back then about the topic of the Messiah was in the Jewish Bible. So you would think, now this may be a little bit hard to follow, but follow me here. 
you would think from a Christian point of view, right, what is the most important passage in the Bible about the Messiah? Again, the Christians have defined the Messiah, their whole definition is one who comes to die for your sins. So from a Christian point of view, this passage is very, very important. If Peter would know anything about the Messiah, from a Christian point of view, he should have known this. He should have known Isaiah 53 teaches, if it's so clear, that the Messiah is going to die for your sins. So in chapter 16, Peter just said to Jesus, Jesus, I believe that you're the Messiah. Now watch what happens. From that time forth, Jesus began to show to his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and not just suffer, but be killed and be raised again on the third day. And Peter took him and said, well, praise the Lord, of course, you're the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Isn't that what Peter should have said? Right? Jesus just told him, look, as the Messiah, you realize that it's important for me now to go suffer and die. And Peter, who should have known about Isaiah 53, teaching us that the Messiah comes to suffer and die, Peter should have said, well, duh, of course you're going to have to suffer and die. That's the whole purpose of the Messiah coming. What does Peter say? Peter says, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Why would Peter say that this can't never happen to the Jesus? Didn't Peter understand that Isaiah 53 was telling us that the Messiah is supposed to suffer and die? Peter seems not to have been aware of this understanding of Isaiah. In Mark chapter 9, the same thing happens. For Jesus taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. They had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Why? Didn't they know Isaiah 53? And if you say, no, they were totally ignorant. So why would they have known anything about the Messiah? You mean, are we to understand that Peter only knew Isaiah 11, where it speaks about the Messiah bringing peace to the world? Why would Peter only know a Jewish prophecy about the Messiah and not what the Christians claim is the ultimate prophecy about the Messiah? So I would su suggest that at the time of Jesus, it was not widely expected or widely known that the Messiah was supposed to suffer and die. And certainly Jesus' own followers, the ones that thought he was the Messiah, didn't have that expectation. Let's turn to page 15. Number two. Another problem with identifying this chapter as about the person of the Messiah is that we saw all of the Jewish prophecies about the Messiah had clear identification markers. One of them was the identification of this person with David. Every prophecy about the Messiah speaks about the Messiah as a descendant of David. Another ID mark is that they speak about him as a king. The fact that he's a king is what allows us to say it's a prophecy about a Messiah. But when you read Isaiah chapter 53, there's nothing at all in the language that screams out Messiah here. Nothing. There's no, like we expect to be, language that speaks about the person of the Messiah. Problem number three is that this passage in Isaiah is not consistent with all the other passages we know are speaking about the Messiah. As a matter of fact, it even gets worse. This idea that Isaiah 53 is speaking about the Messiah has no corroboration anywhere in the Jewish Bible. Let's make this very clear. The Christian says to us, Jesus was the Messiah. And we say, yes, but he died without fulfilling 
any of the messianic prophecies. And we say, that's why he's not the Messiah. He didn't accomplish anything. And they say, oh no, he did. He accomplished the most important thing. He died for our sins. And we say, really? Where do you see this idea that the Messiah is supposed to die to atone for the sins of the world? And they proudly hold up Isaiah 53. And we would say, really? Where else does it say that in the Bible? There isn't anywhere else. What I'm trying to say here is that the entire Christian case for their definition of the Messiah, that the Messiah comes to die to atone for the sins of the world, it rests, the entire case rests on this isolated, solitary, and very controversial passage in the book of Isaiah. There's a book that I bought recently called The Gospel According to Isaiah 53. And it's an entire book that was designed for a missionary program. One of the major missionary organizations in the world has an entire program, a crusade, that they're taking the cities around North America based upon pushing Isaiah 53. And this was a book written as a theoretical material behind this crusade. And in the introduction to the book, Mitch Glazer, one of the editors, writes the following. He says, before you venture forward in this pilgrimage through Isaiah 53, it is essential to know that no other prophecy in the entire Old Testament scriptures explicitly links the death of the Messiah with his work of atonement. That is a very damning admission. And it's a very important point to remember. The Christian missionary case rests, not my observation. This is one of the leading missionaries in North America today. Having to admit their entire case hangs on Isaiah 53. We saw before that the Jewish messianic scriptures were clear and consistent. They were clear, meaning there's no argument about what they mean. No one in the world argues about whether Isaiah chapter 11 is a messianic prophecy. All Jews and all Christians agree. Isaiah 53, we're going to see a very controversial passage. Not at all clear. And we saw that the Jewish messianic vision is not based upon one passage in the Bible. It's based upon at least 10 that are corroborated by hundreds. Here, Mitch Glazer is admitting that the big centerpiece, the centerpiece of their whole theology rests upon this one passage in the Bible with absolutely zero corroboration. There is no consistency. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, number five, I demonstrate the lack of clarity about this passage in Isaiah from a book, or an article actually, called The Suffering Servant in Isaiah by Father Hayden Williams, who's from the Order of Friars Minor Capuchin. I looked them up on the internet recently, very interesting ancient order. And he writes in his book, in his article, I'm sorry, that there are theories which identify the servant with some individual name. Fifteen names have been suggested. So among Christian Bible scholars and commentators, there are at least 15 different theories regarding who the servant of the Lord is in chapter 53 of Isaiah. If it was so clear who it was talking about, you wouldn't have at least 15 theories who it was talking about. And I think that it's true that many Christian scholars acknowledge the lack of clarity in this passage. Walter Brueggemann, I think is his name, a professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary, wrote the following. It is important to recognize that there is a significant scholarly line of argument that concludes 
that this poem, Isaiah 53, will not bear the theological freight familiarly assigned to it, and that its theological claims are rather minimal. One must recognize a certain dis-ease about making a maximal theological interpretation, which is a large Christian inclination on what are at best unstable critical grounds. Again, these are not Jewish scholars. These are Christian scholars who are admitting that the foundation that missionaries use is quite flimsy. Now we're going to go on page 16 to issue number two. Again, issue number one was, is it entirely clear that Isaiah 53 is describing the person of the Messiah? Issue number two, is it entirely clear that Jesus is the subject of this passage? Meaning, even if we were to say, for some reason, even if we were to say that, you know what, Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, the question becomes, how do we know it's talking about Jesus? Right? How do Christians come to the conclusion that Jesus has to be the subject of this chapter? We're going to see a number of problems here. Problem number one. This identification of Jesus as the suffering servant is obviously built upon circular reasoning, as I mentioned before. Christians begin studying Isaiah, again, with their assumption. They begin with the conclusion, Jesus is the Messiah who died for our sins. Once they have that in hand, they then go back to Isaiah and say, oh, Isaiah must be talking about Jesus. The question is, if you don't go from the New Testament back to the Old Testament, but start from Isaiah and try to go forward, the question is, how do you know it's talking about Jesus? Meaning, what is the maximum, what is the most that a missionary can extract from this passage in Isaiah? The very most that a missionary can extract from the, this passage in Isaiah is that, you know what? The Messiah is supposed to suffer. That's the most they can get out of it. But the question is, but how do you know that suffering person is Jesus? That's simply an assertion, an assumption that Christians make. But Isaiah doesn't identify Jesus as the sufferer. The most Isaiah would be saying is the Messiah is going to suffer. And even that isn't so clear. But the real question is number two, how do they know it's talking about Jesus we're going to see in number two here now that actually not only is it not clear that Jesus is the subject, we're going to see that the language of Isaiah seems to exclude Jesus as a possible subject. I want to repeat that. If we read Isaiah very carefully, we're going to see that the language of Isaiah seems to preclude Jesus as a possible subject. Meaning, Isaiah does not line up with the Christian Bible. If we read the Christian Bible, what it says about Jesus, those descriptions of Jesus do not line up with what Isaiah says. We're going to begin in A, and we're going to see there are quite a few points here, but in our outline, it's now 2A. We're going to look at the last few verses in the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. Now, I need you to put on your seatbelts, and as we say in Yiddish, halt cup. You need to give me all of your marbles over the next few minutes because we're going to actually study these three verses carefully. And we're going to ask some probing questions. So the end of chapter 52 says the following. See, my servant shall prosper. He will be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. So the first thing that we're told is that God's servant is ultimately going to be exalted, lifted up, and very high. That's what Isaiah says. Now again, don't forget, Christians are insisting that this servant is Jesus. But we're not going to go there at this point. We're just going to read Isaiah. So Isaiah says that again, the servant is going to be exalted, lifted up, and raised very high. And then Isaiah says something very interesting. Isaiah tells us 
that when the servant is exalted, when the servant is ultimately lifted up and raised up high in the world, it's going to produce a very strong reaction. That the, es the elevation, the exaltation of the servant is going to provoke a very strong reaction. Let's see what Isaiah says. Just as there were many who were astonished at you, saying, Surely his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he startle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For that which they had not been told they will see, and that which they had not heard they will understand. What Isaiah is saying here is that when the servant is exalted, it's going to totally shock and freak out and fry the brains of who? Isaiah says, the nations and kings of the world. Again, follow carefully here. Isaiah says, the servant of the Lord is going to be ultimately lifted up, exalted, and raised very high. When that happens, it is going to come as a total shock and surprise to all of the nations and kings of the world. Why? Isaiah says, because they had never been expecting this. It's something they were never told about, they never heard about. It's totally a freak out to them. We would never have expected this to be what we're seeing. What we're seeing is blowing our minds. That's basically what's been stated in these three verses at the end of Isaiah 52. Again, Isaiah tells us the servant is going to be exalted, lifted up, and raised very high. When that happens, it's going to totally blow the minds of the nations and kings of the world because it's something that they had never expected would happen. If you had to pick one person in the history of humanity, you had to pick one person that if he would be the one in the future who would be exalted, lifted up, and raised very high, if you had to pick anyone in the history of the world, that if he was the one this happened to, it would really not surprise a lot of people. Meaning, who would be the person least likely to surprise the entire world if it turned out he were to be the one lifted up, exalted, and raised very high and vindicated in the eyes of the world through the arm of the Lord? Who would be the person that would cause the least surprise and the least shock in the history of the world? I would suggest it was someone named Jesus from Nazareth. We live in a world today where there are 2.2 billion Christians. They all believe in Jesus. They all expect him to return in his second coming and to be exalted and lifted up and raised very high and acknowledged. They expect the whole world will come to believe in him. There are 1.5 billion Muslims in the world today. And in Islam, they accept Jesus as a prophet. And they also believe in the second coming of Jesus, believe it or not, our Islamic brothers and sisters. So we have now basically 3.7 billion people in the world who, by, by their religion, believe in Jesus, and he's going to come back and be exalted. Plus, aside from Christians and Muslims, many other people who for various reasons are very stuck on Jesus. I went to high school, and we had to listen to Jesus Christ Superstar. And in the world, even among people who are not Christians or Muslims, he probably is somewhat of a superstar. There's probably no one in the history of the world that if he were to be this servant who when he comes and ultimately will be exalted in the eyes of the world would not shock the nations and kings of the world because this is the person that they are precisely looking forward who will do that. Most of the world is expecting Jesus to come back and be exalted. It's not going to surprise the nations and kings of the world. As a matter of fact, if Isaiah was really speaking about Jesus, he should have said who would be shocked and surprised 
if this servant turns out to be Jesus? Who should have Isaiah identified as those who would be shocked and surprised? You people sitting in the room. The 13 million Jews sitting in the world today. We are the ones that would be very, very surprised if it turned out that Jesus was the Messiah. We'd be very shocked. But Isaiah doesn't say the Jews are going to be in for a big surprise. Isaiah does not say the Jews will be shocked when the servant is exalted. Isaiah says it's the rest of the world. And believe me, if Jesus is the one Isaiah is speaking about, that will not shock and surprise the world. He is exactly who the world is expecting. I would say that Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15, if anyone could not be the servant, it is Jesus of Nazareth more than anyone else in the history of the world. But wait, there's more. That was A. There's going to be a B and a C and a D and an E and an F. We're going to a lot of reasons why the language of Isaiah seems to eliminate Jesus as the subject of this passage. In B, Isaiah describes this servant as someone of having a very unpleasant appearance, almost appearing inhuman to the look. People turn their faces away from looking at this servant. His visage is marred more than the sons of men. Is there any reason to assume that Jesus was someone that has such an unpleasant physical appearance? Now, the last time I went to Google Images, I actually did this, and I typed in Jesus, there were many hundreds of representations of what people assume he looked like, and actually, quite good looking if that was him, right? And uh, usually when people conjure up images of what Jesus may have looked like, the way he's usually portrayed in Christian art and iconography is a pretty good-looking dude. You know, bedroom eyes and nice long hair and, you know, Nordic features and, you know, uh, an Adonis, right? The kind of person that could be on one of these trashy novels, what do they call them? Harlequin novels, he could be on the front cover. So no one in the world, as far as I'm aware, ever had an uh, association of Jesus being a very disgusting figure to look at. Not the most important point that I'm making today, but keep it in mind. There was actually a few years ago, forensic uh, anthropologists put together uh, what is probably a more likely picture of what Jesus might have looked like, and it looks like nothing uh, you'd find on Google Images. Uh, C. Now this becomes an important point. C. Isaiah says the servant will be despised and rejected of men. Again, I wanted to walk you through this for a moment. This is an important question that goes back to our issue number one. Does this passage in Isaiah speak clearly about the Messiah? I have a question to ask. It's a rhetorical question, but I have a question. How many times does the Bible tell us the Messiah will be despised and rejected? How often does the Bible tell us the Messiah will be despised and rejected? We know the answer to that question. Nowhere. Unless, of course, unless Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. And then this would be the only place which says the Bible in the Bible that the Messiah is to be despised and rejected, which would basically be one of the strongest arguments against accepting such an interpretation because it is so isolated and unique. Again, the Bible's information about the Messiah that we've seen is consistent. It's corroborated. So the Bible doesn't have an, a consistent picture about a Messiah who will be despised and rejected. But for our purposes here, Let's assume, okay, let's assume that the Messiah is supposed to be despised and rejected. Our question here in part number two is, how do we know this is speaking about Jesus? Question, can we describe Jesus as someone who is despised and rejected? So I'm going to divide this question into two parts. 
Part number two we'll do right now. We'll get back to part number one. After the death of Jesus, has he been popular or basically a nobody in terms of the world? We would have to say that after the death of Jesus, he became the most popular person in the history of the planet. So it's difficult to say now, for example, that Jesus is someone who is despised and rejected. But now let's go back to the Christian scriptures and see when he was alive, what was his reputation. In Matthew chapter 4, this is in the middle of page 16, Matthew chapter 4, verses 23, 25, and Jesus was going about in all of the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all of Syria, from the Galilee throughout all of Syria. And great multitudes followed him from the Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. This doesn't sound like someone who's very unpopular. This sounds like someone that's got a pretty good following. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from the Galilee followed him. Hearing all that he was doing, they came to him in great multitudes from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowds. They wouldn't crush him. There were so many people following him, he could have gotten crushed. Sounds like someone very, very unpopular. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. He didn't get less and less popular. It says that he was getting more and more popular. Luke chapter 4 goes on to say two chapters later on the top of page 17, then Jesus filled with the power of the Spirit returning to the Galilee and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Not praised by a handful of lunatics. It says he was praised by everyone. When you go through the Gospels, they paint a picture of someone who was incredibly popular. So when Isaiah says that this servant will be despised and rejected, we don't have any evidence that you could say about Jesus during his lifetime he was despised and rejected. And you have every reason to acknowledge that after his death, he's become actually the most popular person in the history of the world. D. Isaiah says that this servant will be a man of pain and one who knows sickness. Again, we could ask the question we asked before, how many times does the Bible say the Messiah is going to be someone who experiences pain and sickness throughout his entire life? The Bible never says it. But here the question is, if the Bible is saying that about the Messiah, is Jesus someone that we know experienced pain and suffering and sickness throughout his entire life? There's absolutely no evidence that Jesus suffered throughout his entire life. By the way, we're going to have to come up with a servant that did and does experience pain all the time. Remember that. Isaiah speaks about this servant as not someone who had some pain at one point in their life. Everyone on the planet has had some pain. Someone had appendicitis, someone had gallstones, someone broke their arm, someone had an impacted molar. Everybody goes through periods of pain in their life. Jesus had his pain during a few hours in the last day of his life. But Isaiah is not saying that this servant was someone who would have experienced some pain. Isaiah says he's a man of pain. Ish mach o vav. And that means a man of constant pain. A man whose entire life is characterized as pain and suffering. No evidence that that applies to Jesus, but we're going to have to come up with a candidate for the servant about whom you could say experience pain and suffering all the time. E. Isaiah says that this servant will not open his mouth and in the face of his accusers will be silent. Did Jesus go silently to his death? Well, in Matthew, he pleads before his crucifixion to God to get me out of here. 
He says, and going a little bit further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. But if I had my druthers, I'd rather not go to my execution. And on Matthew 27, 46, at the crucifixion itself, about 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Isaiah says the servant will be silent. He cries out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By the way, if you compare this to the way great Jewish martyrs went to their death, like Rabbi Akiva, who had his skin scraped off of his body by an iron comb, goes to his death saying, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And his students say, wow, I mean, that's incredible. He says, why are you uh, saying this? He said, my whole life I was praying the Shema and saying I should love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And I finally have a chance to do that. I'm going to say this prayer. The thousands of Jews who similarly went to their deaths in the concentration camps, singing, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. Holy Jews who went to their deaths with the Shema on their lips. And Jesus goes to his death, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 18, 36. When Jesus was on trial in front of the Romans, he says to the Romans, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. What is Jesus saying? He was on trial for what? Did the Romans care that he wasn't such a religious Jew? He was on trial for sedition. He was on trial for claiming to be the king of the Jews. That's what it said on his crucifix. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. You're claiming to be the king. That means you don't accept our rule. That's called sedition. It's called being a, a traitor. It's called fomenting revolution against the government. He was on trial for political crimes. And he defends himself very cleverly at his trial. He doesn't stay silent in front of his accusers. He says to the Romans, you have nothing to worry about from me. My kingdom is not a temporal, physical world. My kingdom is not of this world. He says, if it was of this world, my followers would be fighting. F, letter F. Due to the trans... Now, this is a very, very, very serious issue we're going to come up with now. This is almost what you can call checkmate. Due to the transgression of my people, they were afflicted. Christian Bibles inevitably mistranslate this as he was afflicted. But the Hebrew here is very, very clear. Mi pesha ami nega lamo. The word lamo in Hebrew in the Bible appears 54 times. It always is a plural. It means them or to them. Lamo is a plural. And so this passage in Isaiah 53, 8, the statement is, due to the transgression of my people, they were afflicted. What you see from this verse is that the suffering servant is not one individual. Isaiah makes it very clear that the servant is a group of people. They were afflicted. Uh, for example, I have an example here, Isaiah 48, 21. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them, lamo, from the rock. Again, a word appears 54 times in the Bible, always translated as them or to them or for them. G, letter G. Was Jesus someone disconnected from violence? Isaiah says that this servant of the Lord will be someone who does no violence. Could you say about Jesus that he was like a Mahatma Gandhi? Well, in Luke chapter 8, verse 32 to 33, on the hillside it was a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. There was a man that was possessed by demons. A man possessed by demons. And the demons wanted Jesus to take them out of this person, and he gave them permission. And so the demons came out of the men, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now, if Jesus was who Christians say he was, presumably Jesus could have taken out the demons 
and put the demons into a rock or into a cloud. But Jesus placed the demons into an entire herd of swine that, as a result, are killed. We know that our Jewish Bible condemns anyone who causes any unnecessary pain to animals. It's a prohibition in the Torah of Tsar Baal Chaim, causing unnecessary pain to animals. And yet Jesus seems here to have caused an unnecessary destruction of an entire herd of swine. On top of page 18, this is not Jesus speaking directly. This is a parable about Jesus. But in the parable, Jesus says, but as, as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Christians are often shocked when they read this verse in their own Bible. Matthew 18, Matthew 21, verses 18 to 20. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he got hungry. Jesus got hungry. A lot of Jews get hungry sometimes. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it. He wanted to eat some of the figs. But he found nothing on the tree, only leaves. And he said to the fig tree, let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. And immediately the fig tree withered away. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon the fig tree withered away. Mark, in the very next passage, Mark tells us this was not even the season for growing figs. Mark says it wasn't the time for figs yet. And yet Jesus, instead of making a miracle that figs should grow on the tree, he curses the tree and the tree is destroyed. And we know in the Jewish Bible there's a prohibition against destroying trees, especially fruit trees. And yet here, for some reason, through no fault of its own, it wasn't the time for growing figs. Even if it was, trees don't usually have free will. Jesus destroys the tree. John chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. Jesus found those in the temple that were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting in the temple. So he made a whip of small cords and he drove them all out of the temple. A scene of someone making a whip and beating people and driving them out of the temple is not someone I would call he did no violence. In Luke chapter 23, verse 36, this is before the Passion, he comes into Jerusalem, he says to his followers, but now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak to buy one. He commands his followers to buy swords. Interestingly, in John chapter 18, verse 10, Simon Peter cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest with this sword. H. Isaiah doesn't only say that the servant will do no violence. Isaiah says the servant will have no deceit in his mouth. Could that be easily said about Jesus? Well, in John chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus says to his accusers on trial, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. He claims to be a model of transparency and full disclosure. That's what he claims in John 18. Is that true? Let's see. In Mark chapter 4, verses 10 and 12, when he was alone with his disciples, those who were around him along with the 12 asked him about the parables he was always telling. And he, they were asking, why do you always speak in parables? And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and they may indeed listen but not understand, so they may not turn again and be forgiven. First of all, a very strange thing to say. Like, I don't want them to understand so they won't come to the truth. But the point I'm trying to make is, he claimed when he was on trial that there were no secrets, everything was right out in the open, he says here, no, I'm teaching you in coded language so no one will really understand what I'm saying. On page 19, Matthew 16, verses 19 and 20, he says to his followers, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Well, wait. There were no secrets, I thought. So again, it's very hard to say about Jesus. Look, I'm not saying he was a horrible liar, but he's 
claiming to be the servant of Isaiah, where there's no deceit in his mouth. And it doesn't really line up that neatly. In Luke chapter 8, verses 53 and 56, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead, this, woman, this girl was dead, but he took her by the hand and he called out, child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once, and then he directed them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. Again, hush, hush. Interestingly, by the way, he told the Romans what? To defend himself on trial, my kingdom is not of this world, right? I'm a spiritual leader. I'm not the leader of any physical movement that you have to be threatened by. And yet, at the same time, he tells his students to buy swords. I, Isaiah speaks about the servant and says, if his soul would acknowledge guilt. Isaiah says that the servant would be rewarded if he would acknowledge guilt. Some Christian translations have it, if he would make himself into a guilt offering. But the problem here for Jesus is, if you can probably imagine this, the word if. From a Christian point of view, Jesus' role in the world was not volitional. From a Christian point of view, he was sent by God to do this, and he had no choice in the matter. And he couldn't say to God, look God, I'm not interested in being the suffering servant and dying for your sins. From a Christian point of view, there was no choice or volition on the part of Jesus at all. It, however, Isaiah says, the servant has the possibility of yes or no. If he accepts guilt, if he renders himself into some kind of a guilt offering, then he'll be rewarded. But there's no place for this word if in a Christian reading. And then another slam dunk checkmate. Isaiah says that the servant's going to be rewarded. He will see his seed. He will prolong his days. Two strikes and he's out. What does it mean when it says he will see his seed? That means children. In the Bible, seed, zera, means offspring. And unless you believe in the Da Vinci Code, or the other theories that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and had children, the Christian scriptures do not teach any such thing. And as far as we know, at least, the Christian Bible does not line up with this. Jesus did not have zera, and he died at the age of approximately 30, which was not a prolonged days. Now, Christians might say, but he was God in the flesh. It makes absolutely no sense to talk about prolonging the days of an infinite being. You can't prolong infinity. So this description here of the servant is having a reward where he'll have children and have prolonged days certainly does not apply to Jesus. By the way, the word zera, seed, appears over 200 times in the Bible, and it always means just physical children. Christians will insist it doesn't mean physical children. It means many disciples. There are two billion Christians in the world. Those are the children of Jesus. The problem is that there are two words in the Hebrew Bible for progeny. There's the word zera, seed, which means literal physical issue. And then there's the word ben or banim, son, which can be used figuratively for someone who is a child, not literally. For example, in Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, God says, You are the children of the Lord your God. Banim atem Lashem elokechem. The Bible would never say we are the seed of God. The Bible speaks about us as the sons of God, children of God. That can be a figurative child. But zera is always literal. You see this, for example, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, will you question me about my children? God speaks about his children. Doesn't use the word zera, uses the word banim, or command me concerning my work, the work of my hands. But in Isaiah 45, verse 19, just eight verses later, I did not speak in secret in the land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob. That's the zera of Yaakov, because those are physical children. So the Bible is very precise. When it wants to speak about physical children, zera. Figurative descendants, banim. 
And you see this reflected incredibly in Genesis 15, when God has this whole discussion with Abraham about who's going to be the successor of Abraham. And Abraham said to God, O oh Lord God, what else will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my home. I don't have any Zerah, but I have Ben. I have this heir who is Eliezer of Damascus. He's a Ben. And Abraham said, you have given me no offspring, no Zerah. You didn't give me any physical, literal children. And so a slave born to my house is to be my heir, again, a figurative child, Ben. But God came to him and said, no, this man will not be your heir, but one from your very own loins, your very own issue will be your heir. The Bible is very precise in differentiating between figurative descendants and literal descendants. On the bottom of page 19, letter K, Isaiah says, with his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will cause many to be just. With his knowledge, in Christianity, does Jesus relate to people through his knowledge? Meaning, from a Christian point of view, how are people saved? People are saved through the blood of Jesus, through his death and dying. The language of Isaiah has nothing to do with the Christian story. In the Christian motif, it's not that Jesus does anything for anyone through his knowledge. If Isaiah was really trying to give a Christian message, it would have said, with his blood, my righteous one, my servant, will cause many to be just. Actually, there are many, many, many other problems with the language in Isaiah and lining it up with Jesus. We don't have time to go through all of the problems. I just gave you a survey of some of the problems. There are at least three or four or five other difficulties with lining up Isaiah with Jesus. But now we're going to go to part three. The problem is that this claim that Jesus was a sacrifice to atone for the sins of those who would believe in him, that claim is extremely problematic for the following reasons. Number one, if again Isaiah is saying this, if, Isaiah, if you're reading Isaiah as a chapter which speaks about the atoning death of the Messiah, it again would be the only source in the Bible for this. It's an idea which Christians insist is the most central idea in the Bible about the Messiah, and yet it all hangs on this isolated and highly controversial passage. It's not clear, it's not consistent. Number two, B. Interestingly, this passage in Isaiah says absolutely nothing about the need to believe in the death of this servant or his suffering. All of Christianity is hinged on the requirement that we accept Jesus upon ourselves. We accept his death and suffering. We cover ourselves in the blood of the Lamb. That's the condition of Christianity. And yet Isaiah 53 says nothing about a need to believe in or accept the suffering of this servant. As a matter of fact, the language seems to say exactly the opposite. People are saying we rejected him, we despised him, we didn't consider him at all, and yet, it says, he was wounded for our transgressions. So again, the language of Isaiah 53 seems to communicate the exact opposite message that Christianity is claiming. C. The idea of vicarious suffering here is finessed in Christian translations with a very subtle mistranslation. You know, if you saw, I hope you didn't, but as I, I guess it's, it's a occupational hazard of mine. I had to go see the movie by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ. And the movie begins with a full blank screen. And onto this full blank screen is projected Isaiah 53, 5. And it said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the truth is that that's not what Isaiah says. Isaiah says, not that he was wounded for our transgressions. In the Hebrew, it's the mem, mi pesha enu, from our transgressions. He was wounded not for our transgressions, but from, as a result of our transgressions. I always give the example. Imagine a little school, third-year-old, third-grade third class, 
right? And the whole class of wild kids is sitting there and they're throwing spitballs and they're sh shooting paper at each other and they're going crazy and they're running amok in the classroom. And little Johnny is sitting in the front of the room and he's putting reinforcements into his notebook and he's raising his hand and he's doing his... And what's going to happen to little Johnny after class every day? They're going to beat the hell out of him. Now, is he suffering for the sins of his classmates or from their sinfulness? Obviously, it's a world of difference. And the language of Isaiah doesn't communicate the Christian idea of vicarious suffering. D. This Christian idea of Isaiah 53 teaching us that the Messiah dies for the sins of the world is a concept that violates virtually every Jewish biblical teaching about atonement. This is a very serious problem. One, we already learned before today, that's why I did the introduction, that sacrifices were not sufficient to atone for our sins. It's an incredibly huge mistake to think that just because Jesus suffered and died for you, all your sins are forgiven. We saw that, the, that a sacrifice never takes the place of our personal responsibility to do tshuva, to change our ways and to correct our behavior, and to make restitution when possible. If you stole $50 from someone, you can't bring a sacrifice and expect to be forgiven. You gotta pay them back. So the idea that somehow the death of Jesus atones for all sins, past, present, and future, and doesn't require any change on your part. I never forget, I was visiting a friend in a hospital once, and a missionary gave me a pamphlet going into the hospital. It said, are you going to heaven? And you opened it up, and there was a checklist of 20 things. Check off what you think might help get you into heaven. I give charity, and I honor my parents, and I take care of the sick. And it goes through all these wonderful things. And then it says at the end, if you checked any of these things, you're not going to go to heaven, you're going to go to hell. Because the only thing that can get you into heaven is believing in Jesus. Everything else is irrelevant. Two, sacrifices ultimately we saw were not necessary to be forgiven for your sins. The only thing that's necessary is repentance, is tshuva, is correcting our mistakes, correcting our behavior. They are what's ultimately necessary. Three, the Torah does not endorse the idea of an innocent person dying for the sins of guilty people. That's not a concept which the Torah seems to be in favor of. In Exodus chapter 32, that's exactly what Moses wanted to do. After the sin of the golden calf, when God wanted to wipe out the Jewish people, Moses says, no, don't take them, take me instead. But now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, no, whoever has sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. I punish the guilty, I don't punish the innocent. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, parents will not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their parents. Only for their own crimes may people be put to death for. People die for their own sins, not for the sins of others. Ezekiel 18 the word of the Lord came to me saying, what mean you that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? What is this proverb, this saying that you keep on using, saying that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, that the fathers do something terrible and the children suffer the consequences? As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not have occasion to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the Son of the Son is mine, and the, sin, the soul that sins, it shall die. Only the one that sins, not the one that's innocent. Page 21, 4. Jesus, of course, would not have been a kosher sacrifice. If Christians insist that he was a sacrifice, he was not a kosher sacrifice. Number one, we know that sacrifices in the Bible had to be brought and offered by Kohanim priests, not by Roman soldiers. Number two, sacrifices had to be physically perfect, without blemish, without any blemish. Sacrifices had to be set aside for days before they were offered to check to make sure there's not one imperfection on the body. And yet, Jesus was whipped, he was beaten, he had a crown of thorns put on his head, he was stuck in the side by a Roman spear, and he was circumcised at eight days of age, 
which Paul refers to as mutilation. Paul calls circumcision mutilation. And yet, Jesus was physically mutilated. He would not have been a, sick, a physically perfect sacrifice without blemish. Sacrifices had to be brought on the altar of the temple. The Bible specifically speaks against, it's a sin to have sacrifices that are not brought to the temple altar in Jerusalem. When Jesus died, there was a temple, there was an altar, and that would not have been a kosher way to bring a sacrifice. Sacrifices had to be burned on the altar. There was a requirement. Sacrifices were never brought for future sins. Sacrifices only came to address prior sins. And interestingly, the Christian Bible designates Jesus as the Passover lamb, which was not brought to atone for sin. The Paschal lamb had nothing to do with sin. It was a memorial of the historical event of the exodus from Egypt. There was a holiday in the Jewish calendar where people's sins were atoned for. That famous holiday is called Yom Kippur. The Christian Bible makes no attempt to associate Jesus with Yom Kippur. E, if Jesus was the final once and for all sacrifice for sin, why does the Jewish Bible say there will be a third temple in Jerusalem with the restoration of the sacrificial system in the future? For example, in the Christian Bible, the book of Hebrews chapter 8, it says, and by God's will that we have been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, and where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The Christian Bible says no more sacrifices, and yet our Bible says no, there's going to be a third temple with sacrifices. Ezekiel chapter 37, we read before, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. I'll place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. That's a messianic prophecy that even Christians agree to. And it speaks about having a temple rebuilt. Actually, in the book of Ezekiel, there are a number of chapters in the book of Ezekiel, full chapters that describe the third temple and all the sacrifices that are going to be brought there. As a matter of fact, it speaks about the Messiah himself bringing sacrifices in the third temple, including sin offerings. The Messiah will be bringing sin offerings. We see that, for example, in Ezekiel 45. On that day, the prince will provide for himself and all the people of the land a young bull for a sin offering. This chapter in Ezekiel is describing something that hasn't happened yet. This is the third temple. Page 22. The prophet Zechariah describes again the third temple being rebuilt. Malachi as well in chapter 3. And Isaiah chapter 56 also speaks about the third temple. He writes, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. This is the third temple. There will be sacrifices. Why would Jesus be called the last and final sacrifice? To review, number one, approaching the Bible on its own terms. I want to stress that. Approaching the Bible on its own terms without any preconceived agenda, there is no compelling reason to assume that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, and if it were so clear that it was, there wouldn't be dozens of other theories about who it's talking about. Number two, there's nothing in the text of Isaiah specifically identifying Jesus as the subject. Actually, we saw there are numerous things about the text of Isaiah that seems to preclude, to eliminate Jesus as a possible subject. And finally, number three, the entire Christian thesis that Jesus was a, f a sacrifice to die as the Messiah for the sins of the world is a thesis completely out of sync with the Jewish biblical teachings about the topic of atonement.